Hi, this is Franzi in Chicago, and you're listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Hi, everyone. This is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. And in this segment, I am on with Maria Haddon, who is running for alderwoman in the 49th Ward. Hi, Maria. Hi, how are you? Great. How are you today? Doing pretty good. Eight days out. Yeah, yeah. Getting close. So maybe we could start. Could you tell me just a little bit of background about, you know, who who you are and why you've decided to run for alderwoman? Sure. So I've lived in, in this particular uh, ward for 12 years. I've uh, been in Chicago for 15. Currently, I run a nonprofit organization called Our City, Our Voice. And with this group and with my previous uh, organization, the Participatory Budgeting Project, I've spent the last 10 years working with community members, organizations, and local governments to make democracy at the local level more inclusive, more equitable, and, and to just work better for people. I love doing it. I've learned a lot about uh, how much we have in common, what what the priorities are for, for people at the local level, and how how functional government can be when we when we have better decision making and more people at the table. Sure. And after the after the last presidential election, I was like many people, inspired to uh, to do even more, and taking the skills that I've that I've built working with communities and local governments um, here in Chicago and around the country and bringing it to Chicago City Council is, is the best way that I thought I could could help contribute to, to my city and, and my community. Excellent. I love how many fresh faces we see running for the aldermanic wards this time around. It's yeah. really exciting. So tell me a little bit about the, the 49th Ward. What, what part of the city does that cover? Sure. So the 49th Ward is located in the we're the furthest northeast district in the city. It encompasses primarily uh, the Rogers Park neighborhood and a bit of West Ridge. So our border to the north is, is the city of Evanston. To the west is you know, Ridge Avenue, Western Avenue in some pieces. To the south, primarily Devon Street. And, of course, to the east, the lake. So it's a pretty, pretty fascinating community with a long history and tradition of independent progressive voice in, in politics, of diversity, uh, both uh, racially, ethnically, economically. I, I think we have over over 70 languages spoken here. And, and, and regularly, the, the population that, that's lived in the 49th Ward, I think it's for the last two decennial censuses, we're, we're one of the most kind of diverse communities in the country. So uh, that combined with just our, our independent progressive politics, our, our history of activism, and, you know, it's just a wonderful place to call home and I'm excited to have an opportunity to represent it. So these municipal elections uh, for people who are outside of Chicago, these are technically nonpartisan elections. So how do you sort of make sure that people know who you are and, and what you stand for? How do you get your, your voice out there? Sure. You know, without without running on a party platform, it's I think the, the best kind of politics is like these hyper local politics where we get to build our platforms based on the issues of, you know, what's important to people. So it's been um, pretty, pretty traditional as far as how we get that out. So town hall meetings, um, coffees, meet and greets at people's homes, um, going to, you know, neighborhood association meetings, uh, local school council meetings, park district advisory council meetings, nursing homes, senior centers. It's, it's a lot of going to where small groups of people are gathering, introducing myself and talking about where I think we should go, what uh, what I've been hearing are the important issues and, and answering questions for people. You know, it's also door knocking and phone banking it's, you know, making sure that I'm finding groups of people in constituencies. So whether they be members of union organizations or members of political groups or, you know, groups of parents that have a specific particular issue in mind, 
But even though I've lived here for for 12 years and, and have previously been involved with different community efforts, I've never been involved in electoral politics. And so the challenge of of getting started as a as a new person and also facing a, a long-term incumbent. So the incumbent I'm running against has been in for 28 years is about getting their name out there. And so it's taken a large volunteer effort as well. So building building a volunteer organization, building a grassroots campaign has been multifaceted. And so I've spent about 20 months doing it at this point. And what kind of response are you getting from people? I know I live down on the south side, and it's been a new experience to have people actually running for <laughs> aldermen. You know, we're we're not used to hearing from different people. So how are people responding to that? Uh, excited. People are super supportive here. Um, it's been a, a like a, a more positive experience than I could have imagined. So it, it's not just about the message I'm bringing, though I know people People are excited about me, and also people are ready for a change. So it's overall in the city. It's not even just about the the incumbent in our in our ward. It's this political moment that we're in, where a lot of people are feeling like they want to be more involved at the local level. They want to know what's happening. And so when I when I show up at someone's door, um, like hi, you know, my name's Maria Hadden. I'm running for alderwoman. It's my first time running for office, and you know here's what I've been doing, and I want to be an independent, progressive voice for us in city council, they're responsive to it. They're like, that's great. You know what? Thank you. Someone should run. Thanks for running. Thanks for coming out to, to our door. Um, you know, I've done my best to, to you know, uh, make myself as accessible, approachable, and available as possible. And that's also a little bit of a difference that I think people are responding to positively. And if it's any indication of, I guess, another numerical value, we, we have over, I think, over 750 people who've signed up to, to volunteer. And, you know, have, many of them have worked a shift for us. And we've raised, we've raised over $200,000 at this point with, um, I want to say, 62% of that coming from people in my ward. So not only are people happy that, that somebody is running like me, but they're they're volunteering, they're participating in my campaign, and they're contributing to make sure that I'm successful. Um, so it's it's been wonderful. That's excellent. And so, what are some of the issues that are are really driving you? What are the the kinds of issues that you would want to focus on? Sure. So what what I hear people most concerned about. So the the first piece is around how the aldermen uh, and how I will in the future manage development in our community. So you say uh, you live on the south side. Or how long have you been in Chicago? 15 years, I guess, at this point. Okay, okay. So around the city, we're losing, we're losing population, right? Especially we're losing low-income residents. We're losing black residents. And here in Rogers Park, we're, we're not immune from that trend. Um, so a lot of people here tell me they're concerned about the overall change of what is fundamentally a diverse community by the loss of affordable and low-income housing. You know, there are people who, you know, it's not just an issue for low-income people or for renters. It's an issue for long-term fixed-income senior homeowners as well. Uh, people want to be able to stay here. And they're afraid that the same trend of, of kind of this rapid pace. Um, high investment, luxury, residential development, um, that's, that's just overpriced for, for most people in our community, is, is on its way here, and it's happening here a little bit. So development without displacement is the way I talk about what the smart development we're going to have with a, a housing plan that's about not just what's good for next year, but what's good for the next, you know, 5, 10, or 15 years. Um, second big thing, people here care deeply and want to see an alderman that's a champion for our neighborhood public schools. Uh, it's something that I've uh, already been have been doing uh, for a few years here, volunteering with local schools, working with our public school community. And as alderman, I definitely want to use that office to be a better advocate than what we've had so far. We need an elected representative school board. We need to make sure that CPS is moving in the right direction to get an equitable funding formula so that our, our principals, our teachers, our staff, but most importantly, our students get the resources and the programs that they need, as well as the investments in infrastructure. You know, a strong local economy, 
is a uh, third point of the platform. So looking at our local small business community, making sure that, you know, we're moving forward, very excited about the, the big steps we saw this last week for getting our, our minimum wage raised at the state level, you know, happy that we're on a city plan for that. And also knowing that it's important to keep not just these big businesses that, that folks in power tend to try and draw in, but our vibrant local business like economy. So both for a lot of the um, immigrants and refugees in our community, this is a primary path to uh, economic stability, but also it, it's a part of a, like a fabric of, of what keeps us as a resilient community. So our, our small businesses, they're, they're always chipping in, providing space for our community meetings. Um, and of course, for me personally, as a as someone who's kind of a homebody, I like being able to do all, all of my shopping and, and, and whatnot in the neighborhood. And then uh, safe and healthy community. So again, not, none of these are, are ground shaking, right? Innovative platform points. They're just the, the bones of what people say they need, right? Of what builds a strong community. So people here want to feel safe walking down the street. And we live in a pretty safe neighborhood uh, and have a pretty safe ward in Chicago. And we need to keep it that way. We need to build the bonds of, of relationships and community. So I'm bringing back block clubs, making sure that that's a key, it's a key component of, of how I plan to make sure that we're creating the, the types of relationships and the safer streets that are going to be preventative for crime. And also making sure that we need to address and have public budgets at the city level that are funding social services, mental health services, and of course, public education and economic development programs that are addressing the longer term like root causes of, of crime and poverty. Um, so these, these are the things that people tell me they're concerned about and they're all built around what, um, when I ask people, what is it that's gonna make it possible for you to want to stay here? And to be able to stay in this community, you know, and, you know, housing, schools, local businesses and jobs. And of course, uh, the community safety are, are the things that, that, come, that people come back to time and time again. You have a really impressive slate of endorsements. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of the, the network in the community and, and how that's important to have those endorsements behind your campaign. Sure. You know, we were speaking a bit about the, some of the challenges, right, of, of getting one's name out there and having endorsements from, you know, individuals uh, that are higher profile from organizations. For, for me, that's been the most helpful, the helpful part of the campaign. So, you know, getting an endorsement um, that has a lot of local significance. So from former Cook County clerk David Orr, um, for example, it's a huge thing here. Uh, we have a lot of longtime residents who were here when he was their alderman, you know, who helped out on his first campaign, um, or people who supported him through his term as a service in county government, but uh, who remember the name. And also in a time where, you know, not just in a time, it's always a time here in Chicago for corrupt politics. <laughs> uh, it's not new. <laughs> yeah. um, and also it's so important then to have people like David Orr, like Congressman Chuy Garcia, like Congressman Danny Davis, who have been beacons of integrity and, and progressive politics and strong voices for their community. And I'm honored to have their support. So, you know, locally um, having that at David Orr's, being able to, you know, meet and work with through different networks from, from my ward to, to find, you know, who are some of these other kind of mentors, you know, political figures that would be good. Um, a lot of the organizational endorsements, um, some of some organizations that I've been a part of, been a member of or organized with. And, you know, this is about representing membership. And so many members in, in my community are part of organizations like United Working Families or Reclaim Chicago, uh, Northside Democracy for America. And then, of course, the, the labor union endorsements are also very significant for the very same reason from the Chicago Teachers Union to the Cook County College Teachers Union, um, AFSCME Council 31, or SCIU Healthcare Illinois, Indiana, or SCIU Local 73. Those are all organizations with significant um, membership bases in the 49th Ward. And so um, all these democratic structures allow other ways for people to participate. And I've had to go through processes where ward residents in those groups 
um, get to decide whether, you know, they're, I'm the person that they want to support. And it's been invaluable in spreading the word about my campaign. And at this key point in the campaign, boots on the ground, as they say, so door knocking, phone banking, you know, text banking, uh, mailers, emails to, to different constituent groups, they're really helping me to amplify my message, amplify that I even exist as a candidate. And of course, the, the endorsements of support can really help people, especially in a crowded mayoral race, you know, see a clear difference between candidates at the aldermanic level. And if our listeners would like to help out your campaign in this final week, how can they do that? So come by, come by the ward office if you're able. So 1447 West Morse Avenue. We're at the uh, southeast corner of Morse and Greenview. Office is open seven days a week and come come volunteer for a shift. We do training for every shift. We have great snacks and uh, it's a lot of fun. So you can come do phone banking or, or door knocking with us. Uh, if you're not able to, to do the in-person volunteering, but maybe want to do something, if you live in the ward, want to do something closer in the block, we do have a precinct caption system. We can have you just talking to neighbors on your block. Um, we're still taking campaign contributions. Of course, every dollar counts, especially in this last week. So you can make a campaign contribution at maria449.org. So it's M-A-R-I-A. FOR49.org. And of course, if you know anybody that lives in the neighborhood, if you live here, please consider voting for me um, or spread the word. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's what we need here in this final week. All right. Excellent. Well, Maria, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I'm so excited about all of these campaigns and, and I really hope we see some real change. Well, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kelly. All right. Thank you. I am on in this segment with Eileen Dordek, who is running for alderman in the Chicago 47th Ward. Hi, Eileen. Hi, how you doing? I am great. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So to start us off, could you just tell me a little bit about your background and why you've decided to run for alderman? Sure. So I am a 22-year resident of the 47th Ward. I have raised my children here. I have a college student and a junior in high school, and I have a social work practice here in the ward. So I'm a small business owner in addition to serving the community as a social worker. And I really see my job as a social worker as listening to people, engaging resources, and help solve problems. And so I want to take that skill set to the job of alderman, because I think it's so important that a alder person be really responsive to the community and really engage with their community in setting policy and setting priorities about problem solving in the community. I also have been on a political action committee board called Personal PAC, which supports candidates who support reproductive justice. And I served on that board for nine years. And I was part of the endorsement committee, and what I learned was that there are so many elected officials who are wonderful, um, but what's really important is if you really care about issues, you have to elect people who care about those issues. There's so many different things that you can focus on, and so I realized that I wanted to make sure that people's rights were being protected. I've been an ally to the LGBTQ community for decades, as well as fighting for women's issues. And so I think it's really important to have a voice in city council to make sure to be a hawk on those issues and fight for people's rights. So that's a lot of, you know, where I come from to run for this job. I did the Illinois Women's Institute for Leadership, which is a training program for women to run for office, which really helped me to figure out, you know, how to go about the process. And as a social worker, I think it's really important to think about people think about how environmental factors affect them. And that's another voice that I want to bring to city council. And tell me a little bit about the 47th Ward. What part of Chicago is this? So it's on the north side. It's Lincoln Square, North Center, Ravenswood area. And we have a pretty diverse ward as far as having 
people who've been in the community a really long time, a lot of new residents. And it's this community has changed a lot over the last 22 years since I've been here. And so I think it's really important to have some knowledge of kind of where we've been, even though obviously we have to move forward, but you want to do it in a really thoughtful way. What are you hearing as you're out and about talking to people around the community? What are you hearing from them? What are the the kinds of things that they're concerned about in, in electing a new city council? Yeah, well, there's going to be a lot of change this year, and I think some of that's really exciting and some of it is a little scary for people, but it is a wonderful opportunity to really make some serious change, and and people are really tired of the old Chicago way, and so the opportunity to have people go in there, people like me who have a lot of integrity and want to get things done and not just, um, you know, as a social worker, I'm somebody who's worked on helping people solve problems to see, to meet their needs. And I think that's really refreshing for voters. I'm also hearing a lot about property taxes. We've had a lot of increase in property taxes. Um, people who've lived in the community for a long time have seen their property taxes go up and up, and there's not a lot of confidence in the assessments that people are getting. And so we're looking forward to hoping the new assessor really makes some difference in transparency. But also it's really important that we don't keep increasing property taxes on middle class families, families who've lived here a long time, and seniors who are really fearful of having to be be forced out of the neighborhood. We also have heard a lot about, you know, TIFs. People seem to be really sick of these programs that have been run in Chicago for years where they're like the um, tax increment financing districts take a lot of our taxes out of circulation for development, but they're put into pools of money that are not transparent and people don't know where the money is going to and often goes to developers who would be able to build some of the things that they're building without getting tax taxpayer money. And a good example of that is last year, city council voted to give Presence Health, which is a um, healthcare provider that doesn't provide full reproductive services. And city council gave them over $5 million in taxpayer money for their corporate offices. And I think that people are really sick of our tax money being given away when there's discrimination in the services provided. So I I think you started to get at some of this, but people who may be outside of Chicago may not realize there are actually 50 wards in Chicago. And so this is a a rather large city council. I think a lot of people have sort of thought of it as kind of a a rubber stamp on the mayor. Uh, A lot of people who are aldermen remain aldermen for decades. So how do you sort of view the the whole city council and and sort of what your role within it would be, what you'd like to see out of this body? You're absolutely right. And there are things that are so surprising and, and frustrating, which is the mayor appoints the heads of committees for city council. And the city council needs to take up the mantle of it being in control of its own legislative body and making sure that the city council makes decisions about their own leadership. Because the idea of a legislative body is to be a check on the mayor and a check on city hall. And I feel like city council for many decades has ceded that responsibility to the mayor. And because we have this decentralized city council, It has become often a rubber stamp, and I think it's really important that people are able to dissent and are able to, you know, not agree with the mayor and everything, because that's what a healthy electorate expects. We expect, you know, people to represent the different needs, and and there's some real strengths to the breadth of the city council, which is everybody should have an alder person in their ward who is accessible to them, who's their neighbor, they should be able to go into the alderman's office and talk to her or him and get their needs met. But it also means that that person's representing them in city council. And and as a legislative body, all of the alder people should be representing 
the whole city and trying to make it a better city for all. And I think for far too long, the um, wards have been pitted against each other for resources instead of trying to make the city better for everyone. And I, d I don't think, I think it's a false choice that you have to choose. I think you can serve your ward and be responsive, but also try to make decisions that will make things better for everybody in the city. So you've talked some about the different issues that are driving your campaign. Can you talk a little bit about how those issues would work within city council? So which things are sort of under the purview of the aldermen and, and what are the sorts of things you could sort of directly do for the, the ward, the 47th ward? Yeah, and I think that speaks to the issue of uh, this is a really unique elected office, which is the reason why I'm running for um, alder person and not for another office is because of this unique aspect that you have these two really important jobs. One is to serve as a person who votes on citywide policy and creates citywide policy. You're also in the ward providing city services out of the alderman's office. And that aspect of constituent services is really appealing to me as somebody who's served my community for many years as a social worker. And so there are things that, you know, within the ward, you can bring the community together around projects, around issues. I have been a community organizer and volunteer coordinator for many years. And I think it's really important when a, a lot of what the alderman does is zoning and development. And it's really important that you get input from the community. But a lot of times people who are against projects are more motivated to show up at community meetings than people who are for them. Because if you like something, you go, yeah, I like that. I don't have to fight for it. And one of the things that I could really do for this community is get people out and bring them together. I'm a good listener, but I also help people listen to each other. And you have to do that um, when you're convening groups to, to have input in a community. We want people to have a say, but we also want to keep moving forward. And I think that um, I will do a really good job of that in the ward, getting input, helping people see each other's point of views, even if we don't always agree in the end. And then for citywide issues, I think that we need, for example, an affordable housing plan for the whole city. Again, because of our system, aldermen have been able to keep affordable housing out of their wards for decades. And it's not only unfair, but I think it's unhealthy for a community to not have diversity in its neighborhood. And our neighborhood needs that diversity and affordable housing is one way that we can help keep our neighborhood a healthy neighborhood. And so I think we can have a citywide affordable housing plan. I want to get rid of the ban on accessory dwelling units, which are like basement apartments or apartments over garages, which could be naturally occurring, uh, more affordable housing in the ward. And I think that's something we could do citywide that would really make an impact quickly. The aldermanic prerogative, which has really kept affordable housing out of a lot of neighborhoods, it's not the law. It's a habit. It's a culture that city council has allowed to continue. And that's something I really think I want to be a part of changing at city council is to change the culture of to collaboration that alder people shouldn't just be looking out for their ward and we need to make it better for the city as a whole. So I noticed on your endorsements page, a couple of heavy hitters, Jan Schakowsky, who's a longtime congresswoman, and Deborah Shore, who is a powerhouse of a Metropolitan Water Reclamation District Commissioner. That's a, a long thing, but I think our listeners will be familiar with the uh, <laughs> Metropolitan Water Reclamation District because I talk about it a lot. Yes, I was going to say it's also one of my favorite slightly unknown areas of government because yeah. they protect our water and they make sure that we have healthy drinking water, which is really, really important. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about those uh, endorsements and what those endorsements mean to a campaign like yours? Sure. Thank you for um, asking about that. Yeah. Jan Schakowsky is a role model for me. She's been a congresswoman for 20 years. She represents my parents' district, which um, they live in the suburbs, but she also represents four precincts in the 47th Ward, which is really exciting. And we met... 
I wanted to talk with her and, and hope to get her endorsement. And she and I have a lot of shared values. We both care a lot about reproductive justice. We care a lot about the LGBTQ community and protecting their rights. We care about, you know, protecting people and consumers. She started her career in consumer advocacy. And I think she saw a um, an ally in me, somebody who's willing to put herself out there and fight for other people and make sure that our progressive values are expressed and and put into policy. And so when she decided to come on board and endorse me, that really opened doors for me. And then I've also been endorsed by Senator Heather Staines, who is often at the top of so many of the wonderful bills that we see at the state, like HB 40, which protected women's reproductive rights in Illinois. I've been endorsed by the Chicago chapter of Now PAC, the NASW, which is a national association of social workers, which is my professional organization. So it's a real honor um, to be endorsed by them. Commissioner Bridget Gaynor, Cook County Commissioner Bridget Gaynor, um, State Representative Ann Williams. And um, as you said, Deborah Shore, in addition to three other Metropolitan Water Reclamation District commissioners. And I think, you know, it's such an honor because I know these women know that I'm a fighter. They know that I'm a collaborator, that we're going to all work together on issues um, that we all care about. The M- WRD um, commissioners know that environmentalism is really important to me, and I'm going to fight for that. And I'm also really proud that I've been endorsed by the Cook County College Teachers Union as well. So if our listeners would like to help out your campaign, either from within the city or maybe outside the city, how can they do that? Well, they certainly could let their friends and relatives who are in the 47th Ward know about me. They can um, go on social media and share information. I have some really interesting videos. One is on um, tax increment financing, and it explains that. Another one's on the accessory dwelling units. And then I have one that I did recently that reaches out to um, the deaf community because I um, actually sign. I know some language. And I met with a group um, who lived at a building for people who are deaf and hard of hearing called the Silent Cooperative in the ward. And they asked me to do a video in a um, American Sign Language. So that's also on my Facebook page and my website. And people, we always need people to door knock and make calls. People could email me at friends at eileendordick.org or go to our website, eileendordick.org to find out more. All right. Is there anything else that you wanted to make sure we talk about? There are only 14 women in city council right now. And I don't think anybody should vote for me because I'm a woman, but I'm the best candidate. And I think it's so important that women's voices, women's life experience, women's perspective are in city council. And when we're only a quarter of the representation, I know that's part of the reason why I stepped up to run for office, because I think it's really, really important to have more women in. And I'm also like, I'm not interested in running for higher office. This is the job that I'm really interested in. I'm excited about the constituent services aspect. I'm excited about city policy. And I want to do this job and serve the community that I've been in for 22 years. And then, you know, I'm not looking to set up a fiefdom for the next 40 years. I want to do my job, do it really well. And then, you know, you leave it to somebody else down the road. So that's what I'm aiming to do. And I'm I'm just hoping that I get the opportunity to serve this community that I love. And just so you know, the election is Tuesday, February 26th. And in my race, we will definitely go to a runoff. So I am hoping that I will also be on the ballot on April 2nd. Yeah, I suspect, uh, given the number of people running in a lot of races around the city, that (laughs) we will all be voting in runoff. (laughs) Yeah, I think there are going to be quite a few. I agree. Yeah, certainly the mayoral election seems likely to go to a runoff as well. For sure, for sure. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. And we'll put your information up on our website. So if people want to check that out, they can help out with your campaign. And uh, hopefully everybody that's in the city is getting out and early voting or planning to vote next Tuesday. Exactly. Kelly, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. It was fun talking with you. (laughs) 
I'm on in this segment with Colin Bird Martinez, who is running for alderman in Chicago's 31st Ward. Hi, Colin. Hey, how are you? Thanks, Kelly, for having us on. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be talking with you. So could you start by telling me just a little bit about your background and why you've decided to run for alderman? Sure, yeah. So I'm a a volunteer community organizer in the area. I decided to do that because this is my home and me and my partner feel this really strong sense of community in Hermosa. And what I've noticed after over time is those same people who brought that sense of community who have lived here their whole lives or for for decades are getting pushed out of the community. Uh, There's a lot of changes in the east side of the ward, particularly in Logan Square. I saw a lack of proactive leadership around that or even awareness around that. So me and my friends and family and neighbors decided that we should make change in the community. And so we ran for office. I like to call it co-governing. I don't like to say I, this is about us winning. So yeah, so we're running a a progressive campaign on community first, and that's about keeping the folks in the community that have called this, this, uh, their, their forever home, which I also call it. So uh, that's why I decided to run. In terms of like background, so yeah, I started our, a neighborhood association five years ago called the Hermosa Neighborhood Association. It's a not-for-profit, and it brings people together in the community weekly. I'm also advocating for different um, traffic abatement measures. It's very difficult to walk in the community, mm-hmm. bringing like a new playground at a school that desperately needed them. I'm also on the local school council at that school as well. And I'm very involved in progressive politics, so getting uh, state representatives, neighboring aldermen, and a new uh, attorney general that we have um, helping through different organizations I'm a part of, getting them elected. Excellent. Can you tell me a little bit about the 31st Ward for people who might not be as familiar uh, with the ward? So, yeah, the 31st Ward is on the northwest side, a little bit more on the far west uh, northwest side. It includes parts of uh, Logan Square, the majority of Mosa, uh, a big, almost majority of Belmont Cragen, and then a small piece of Portage Park. So it's a decidedly working class community of folks that are mainly long term residents and then also a gateway community, meaning a community for new immigrants to the United States. So you see this uh, secession from Irish to Polish to what is today Puerto Rican and, and a Mexican-American community, so with a large manufacturing base. You started to talk about some of the, the issues, but what are some of the issues that you're hearing from people as you talk to people in the neighborhood, as you've been working with your, your neighborhood organization? Sure. So the top three issues are housing issues, education issues, and crime, They're in, in no specific order there. So People are very worried about the safety. You know, uh, the mayor here, Rahm Emanuel, and including our aldermen, say that crime is going down and it's something not to worry about. And yet when I go to doors, no one will let their children outside by themselves. And people feel fairly terrorized by the uh, the sound of nightly gunfire. So that's uh, a big issue in the community. Housing is a very big issue on the east side of the community here in Hermosa and um, West Logan Square. The areas are experiencing gentrification. We're seeing massive um, increases in people's rents and property taxes. So, again, people are being pushed out of the community. And then education is suffering here. We've lost over 2,000 students um, collectively from our elementary schools and our high schools in the ward. Um, The one that I live closest to is called Kelvin Park High School, and it's lost half of its population on top of losing half of its population before. So... It used to have 2,000 students. Today it has 400, and it's at threat of closing, so I'm very concerned by that. And then uh, the school I'm at, an elementary school, the roof leaks, this playground was hurting children, and CPS wouldn't do anything about it. So it's about really advocating investment in our neighborhood schools. Um, This is a very young ward in terms of average age. It's 28. It's about making sure that people can stay in their community, especially as um, amenities are coming to it and not just get pushed out. Those amenities should be for the people who have lived here lifelong. And then addressing violence in a way that doesn't create a police state. So making sure that we're looking at neighborhood focused approaches, um, creating block clubs, fixing a lot of the issues um, from a neighbor by neighbor le- level restoring the public trust in the police by having an elected uh, police board and being and letting the community hire or fire the police superintendent, as well as bringing more gain intervention programs 
and advocating for free community college, which I think will really give hope to young people in the community. Mm-hmm. I was interested on your website to see you had a whole section on constituent services and some of the solutions that you would like to see for that. And that, of course, is a, a huge part of the job of an alderman. Could you talk a little bit about the, the kinds of ways you would like to address constituent services? Sure. So on average, that is, I would say, about half the more majority of the job. You get over 50 requests per day. Uh, and those need to be, uh, you need to be accountable to those. You need to follow up. You need to show empathy and sympathy. So uh, even today, as we canvass, we are taking this data because we want to know about our constituents' issues proactively and not waiting reactively for them to call us and be angry about their um, uh, problem because it hasn't been addressed in the past. So that's one part we want to do. We want to also involve more young people. So we want to do youth policy making. Um, our vision, uh, our policies, as you see them, are a living document based on people that come in the door and start uh, volunteering and tell us about their issues. We have a lot of themed canvases based on people's what they want to see changed in the community. So we've had ones on domestic violence, on women's issues, on uh, affordable housing. And so just making sure that we're doing that as well, involving and co- having go governance with the community. I have limited proficiency in Spanish and in in spaces that are monolingual Spanish, even if they're translating, I may feel uncomfortable because I'm doubling the time in the meeting and I'm one or one or two folks that are monolingual English speakers. I want to make sure that not only are we providing translation in Polish and Spanish, but that there's an ease where people people don't feel like a burden. So making sure we're doing things like simultaneous translation, as well as a lot of these meetings aren't accessible to people who need walking aids. So making sure that wherever these meetings are ADA compliant. So, and these meetings will be things around community driven development. So not me deciding that, you know, a luxury apartment or a Best Buy comes in the community. It's the community that decides that as well as the aldermen get a bank account to make updates in the community every year for streets, lights, what have you, making sure that the community is getting the input. And again, me not deciding what's best for the community. So, what we're really focused on in terms of constituent services is having a lot of feedback, reacting to that feedback, and in terms of policy making, making sure I'm co-governing with the community and advocating as a representative for the community on what they want to see addressed in City Hall. Yeah, I love that. I think that's something that a, a lot of people in Chicago don't feel very connected to their aldermen, despite the fact that there are 50 aldermen <laughs> should have a, a pretty good local connection there. And that doesn't always happen. Yeah, you need to be a role model. Can you talk to about uh, environmental issues? I was pleased to see that on your website. I, this is something I, I haven't seen very many aldermanic candidates or mayoral candidates talking about. Can you talk a little bit about what, what you'd like to see the city doing in terms of uh, improving the environment? Sure, yeah. So we want to see the creation of a, an environmental justice department. Uh, we want to see a just transition to 100% renewable energy by 2030. And what a just transition means is making sure that the green jobs go to people who live in these communities, uh, making sure as you do that transition that the burden isn't putting on working families, that the burden is put in on uh, the corporations and 1% that cause a lot of these issues in the community, making sure that we're properly investing to replace not only um, all the lead pipes in public buildings and within the main water and sewer system, but also that we're doing that helping people with their services uh, service lines. I had to get mine replaced and it was over $10,000. You know, a lot of people can't afford that. So making sure that we're providing aid and assistance to make sure that all lead pipes are gone from the communities. Um, And at a local level, uh, again, you know, Aldermen get this little bank account, making sure we're just showing advocacy on what things we can do. So I want to make little nature oases uh, in all our parks. So restoring a little part of the prairie, Uh, for, you know, native insects, native plants, um, and bees to thrive. So those are some of the things that we're thinking about doing. That's great. You mentioned earlier that this is a gateway community for new immigrants to the city. Can you talk a little bit about the kinds of issues that are are facing immigrants, of course, some of whom may not yet be able to vote, but whose rights and and livelihoods need to be protected and, and what that means for an alderman to be able to help them with that? Sure. Yeah. So in our campaign, we're making sure that we're 
intentionally incorporating vulnerable communities, which is immigrants, young people, and women in our community. So particularly with immigrant populations, some things that have been brought up and want to be addressed uh, through our vision is making sure the city is a real sanctuary city. It has a lot of carve-outs, including the gang database uh, that, that can be targeted and subpoenaed by ICE and, and terrorize people in our community. ICE has done raids in the community that creates fear and, and has about a third of the population afraid to even you know, be involved with um, addressing issues at the schools, other things, having their voices heard because they feel like and, and, it's, and it's valid that that will be used against them. So we want to create at a local level an immigration defense committee with pulling funds from other aldermen that have created this. So this is uh, bringing awareness to issues around ICE, bringing issues around the socioeconomic impact that the United States has had on Mexico and Central America that has caused um, immigration and realize that these are bigger issues. So we want to politicize folks. A lot of that will happen, obviously, outside of the ward office and, and uh, city time that will happen. And when this movement is over, this campaign will turn into a continuous campaign, essentially for a change in the community and bringing progressive ideas and making sure we're protecting a lot of vulnerable communities and particularly immigrants. Again, they make up a third of the population here. You have a, a lot of really great endorsements, including Run for Something, which is an organization uh, that we work with a lot on the podcast, but also the Chicago Sun-Times and, and several other organizations. Can you talk a little bit about sort of that, that networking and the support from uh, both from a sort of structural perspective, but also support from the community? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, we have a great lineup of endorsements from different organizations. Run for something. Uh, just had a Instagram takeover the other day, so we were able to spread our uh, message nationally, our community first vision. Some more other organizations I'm involved with is Reclaim Chicago, National Nurses United, the People's Lobby, who all have endorsed us. So I've been involved with them for a long time. I credit them as being the the folks that politicized me around the um, the dominant narrative of corporations and one percent, you know, as pawns and dividing us by our race and defeating that, defeating racial capitalism, and defeating gender oppression, and we integrate those things in our campaign. Those organizations also give a lot of political advice. They give us, uh, help us get access to earned media. They help us define our organizing model. So I credit uh, them as well as Run for Something and all the other organizations that have endorsed us for really uh, driving um, our vision, making sure that we're organized in the field to win this. If our listeners would like to help your campaign, whether they're in the neighborhood or outside it, uh, how can they do that? Sure, yeah. So they could go to www.colinforchicago.com. There's a form there called support, and they can file that to uh, volunteer, ask for a lawn sign, make a donation as well. And then our, our campaign office is at 4203 West Fullerton Avenue. So it's on the corner of Fullerton or Keeler for those familiar uh, and in the ward. So we also spend a lot of time reaching out to people in the field. So when people seem like they have a lot of structural analysis on what the things that are keeping us down and not having their voices heard, we ask if they want to get involved in the campaign. And we have a great field organizer uh, who makes sure that we involve those folks. Um, and again, really trying to incorporate the voices of women of young people and immigrants to make up the vast majority, um, you know, almost uh, 70, 75% of this community. So making sure that we're incorporating those those voices so every part of the board can be heard. So we may also reach you at your doors if you uh, live, live in the ward. Is there anything else that you would like to make sure we talk about? Yeah, just that this campaign has uh, really inspired a lot of people to get involved. There was a lot of people had given hope up in this ward. It's a very cloud-heavy ward. And what that means is, uh, you know, it was uh, um, occupied by about six aldermen over 100 years um, that sort of treated it as a little piggy bank. And people really see a change in the community, and, and they want to see – uh, an erosion, you know, obviously an elimination of that. So uh, again, 100 uh, volunteers helping this campaign. We have over 450 small donations. So really trying to do that Bernie Sanders style of making sure that we are 100% accountable to the folks in this community. 
and not accountable to luxury developers and corporations like uh, Exelon or Comcast. So we're being very intentional. It's a lot more work, but it's important to, to win victory this way. So yeah, those are some things. And again, I would love uh, anyone on the podcast to get involved uh, in any way they can. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I know it's uh, it's really busy now, uh, less than a week out from the election. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, now now's the uh, now's the time to help. We <laughs> we got a lot of uh, folks coming out for get out the vote, but we definitely would love more. Great, and we'll put your information up on our website as well, so people can find that. And Colin, thank you so much for speaking with me, and best of luck next week. I appreciate it. Thanks, Kelly, for having us on. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast.